This is Allison. Welcome to the webinar. Hey, Allison. Hi, Chris. How are you? Good. How are you doing? Good. Wonderful. So, um, I know some people are still joining in. We've got about 40 people already logged in. It looks to me like it's one o'clock uh, on the dot. Just say um, that a uh, little bit of housekeeping. Everybody could check to make sure that they have muted. Um, we also have a chat window that you should be able to see in your Zoom somewhere. And in that, um, we can ask for you guys to write in your questions as they come along, and then we can review those at the end in our question and answer period. Um, and also, I can use that to chat to you if I think your microphone is on. So I'm gonna do a quick check, see if there's anybody else with their microphones on. Um, actually, maybe it'll be quicker if I just say, Amanda could check um, hers. It looks like um, a number of people have their videos uh, disabled, but not their their uh, audio, their speakers, um, their microphones. So you could double check that you've got both canceled so we don't have extra noise on the call. So. Iris and Chris and I don't know everybody else's. Um, B.E. Horton, Joan S. 30, all are showing as if they could speak. Kyle, Phil, Okay, it looks like it's getting better. Thanks, everybody. Sounds nice and quiet. Okay. Um, so, because we're such a large group, I'm not going to ask everyone for um, introductions today. Um, I'm just going to uh, kick this off and then hand it over to Eric and Chris and then uh, We'll have some time for question and answers towards the end, like I said. And um, let's see. I'm going to see I can forward to the next slide here. I'm trying to forward to my. So uh, this webinar today is part of the um, evaluating the suitability of roadway corridors for use by monarch butterflies project that we have been running here at the Monarch Joint Venture with funding from the National Cooperative Highway Research Program um, overseen by the Transportation Research Board. And I wanted to acknowledge all of my co-authors, um, co-investigators on this project who are uh, shown here. And um, this is my email address at the bottom. Most of you have received emails from me, but if not, feel free to reach out at any time for more information about the project. And um, we are developing tools for roadside managers who are interested in providing habitat for monarch butterflies. And um, as many of you know, we have a landscape uh, prioritization model. That's what we'll be hearing about today. We've also developed a rapid assessment methodology for practitioners to evaluate habitat along their roadsides in the field using Survey123 on a mobile device. Those data are put through a habitat calculator and uh, scores are given to sites in that fashion. Um, and then we also are developing a number of um, decision support materials and outreach documents that will help managers um, communicate about the management that they're doing. Um, so those are all the different parts of the project and um, coming up we're going to have a webinar about the rapid assessment in habitat calculator in a couple weeks um, so you can tune in for that one as well and then today we're hearing about the landscape prioritization model. I'm going to be turning the call over to Eric Lonsdorf and Chris Newtonboom 
who are both at the uh, Institute on the Environment at the University of Minnesota. And they're affiliated with the Nat Natural Capital Project. Um, and so uh, that is my introduction and I'm going to uh, attempt to pass the uh, screen over to mm -hmm. Chris. And Eric. <laughs> And Eric, who are they together in the same place? No, we're not. I'm going to start, um, but I think you have to stop sharing first. Okay, so uh, let me try to do that. Do you want to? Uh, okay. So I stopped sharing. See if you can grab it. Yep. All set? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks, Allison, for that introduction. Um, we're going to, I think we're pretty excited to show you guys the tool we've developed. Uh, just a little first, a little background on Monarchs. I think most of you know this already, but just to get us in the mood for the tool itself and the challenge of prioritizing roadside roadsides for monarch habitat. Uh, the challenge, of course, is that the monarch is a tri-national species. It migrates uh, from the winter. It's overwintering sites in Mexico, northward over the course of several generations in its life through the spring in the south and then northward into uh, the kind of northern Great Plains in the Midwest, upper Midwest. And there's an overwintering site also in um, California. Um, that will address as well. All right, and then at that overwintering site, uh, they form these dense clusters that are measured in terms of the number, the size of the overwintering site in terms of hectares in these dense conglomerations. And we know from sampling that site, we being others, uh, that it, the population has been declining over time, although this year it had uh, people were happy about the, the size of it in terms of the uh, habitat. But in 2014, I think that's sort of what brought a lot of people together around this issue is that you, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service initiated a review of the status and, and they're going to come up with a listing decision of 2019. And so basically the conclusion of that is that, you know, wherever monarchs can have habitat, everyone is going to need to get together and pull together to try to uh, create additional habitat for them to increase their population size. And so one of the types of habitat of the sectors are roadsides. And so that's where I think this project comes in is to try to address that challenge for roadside management, um, particularly at sort of our role in developing this tool was providing something that gave insight at a broader scale across the landscape and providing context for where to prioritize uh, putting in monarch habitat or maintaining existing habitat. Um, it's really difficult, I, I'm assuming, to cover all possible roadsides and um, for monarchs. And so trying to figure out where the best sites are would be great, taking into account parts of the landscape that one can't see. And that's where I think this tool comes into play. Um, so the, the reason and rationale for this is to bring and integrate sort of our up-to-date knowledge of what monarchs require in terms of habitat and then deliver that uh, to roadside managers. So we're going to give a brief description of the tool, um, how it works, how, how to use it, um, a little bit about sort of the calculations that are sort of under the hood that you don't have to see, and then provide some time for questions. I'm going to start off with the description and then turn it over to Chris in a, in a little bit. All right, so the tool, the general idea of the tool is that it combines two uh, major inputs, potential habitat uh, for the monarch using a land cover, land cover information and in kind of the broad landscape. And if those of you that aren't talking could mute, that would be great. Like I think there's someone out there that's talking. I don't know. Thanks. Um, and then the other input besides land cover are road layers, right? So really we're trying to integrate where we think monarchs are going to be and then where 
you know, overlaying roads on top of that to identify here on the output some sort of prioritization or areas of potential monarch habitat that could be used for, for roadsides. And what we're going to do is sort of talk through the kind of the key inputs of that. Okay, so the tool mainly is to compare roadsides within a given area or state using this suitability index, but there's also some other things that it could be used for. Uh, to locate areas where roadside habitat may complement high functioning surrounding habitat, right? There could be some nice prairies or patches where there are monarchs and a roadside could be created to create a corridor, um, as it says in the second point. And also we've used it, um, and we can talk about this um, some other time, but we've selected um, sampling locations because the model does predict where there should be good monarch habitat. Um, and then it's also meant to be used sort of in conjunction with this rapid assessment of roadside habitat for Monarch's tool and can help target ro roads with high suitability index, but potentially currently low actual habitat. Okay, and this, um, so kind of this seminar plus the one you're gonna hear together, um, they're kind of a, a two-part package. Okay, so our goal in creating the tool was to create something that was, could be used across the country um, and try to create some standard data inputs across states, like the National Cropland Data Layer, for example. This land cover then predicts where there's potential habitat. The roads then kind of identify specifically where that management can, to, could occur. And also we're hoping it's easy to use. That's our goal, using software that's familiar to all the DOTs. Um, so we've chosen ArcGIS. Um, my personal opinion about ArcGIS, it's not the best, but it is the only one that's usually available, so we all have to use it. Um, and then the inputs themselves are simple and widely available, okay? All right, so that's sort of the broad overview. It's a pretty, I think, simple to use, effective tool, um, but we're gonna walk through sort of how one uses it. So Chris, I'm gonna stop sharing and you take it from here. Sounds good. Alrighty, can everybody see my screen? Yes. And hear me well? Yes. Perfect. All right, are you can meet now? Um, so I'll be walking through a couple of different sections, how you use the tool first off, so where you download it, what do you do with the files inside of it, and what data goes where, kind of a hand-holding process so that people can start off using this really rapidly. And then I'm going to be going more deeply into the methods and the, the ecology that underpins what we are pretty confident in is a pretty awesome tool. So first off, just to start simple, this is what you get when you download the model. It's just a, a zipped folder with the model inside and a couple of source files. Just as a, a note for the data stuff, um, you do need to run this on ArcGIS Spatial Analyst. Um, however, it's not an advanced licensed tool, so for those of you who will run this and have questions, shoot me emails, but it's, it's meant to be fairly applicable across different versions of ArcGIS. Um, the source files, that's for the internal mechanisms of the tool. It pulls off of different tables and layers, and that's not really important for the users to know. It's just there. Don't mess with it. It's important, but not relevant to you. And this is, this is the tool itself. Um, it's a fairly simple in, interface um, meant to be run on a very small amount of data. So there are really only four things that you need to provide this tool for it to work. Um, and Eric kind of foreshadowed those a little bit. So first you have the land cover data. This, uh, the national cropland data layer. Um, it's downloadable online, it's really easy to access, and there's a link to it in the methodology and in the tool itself. So it's really easy to grab this data for your state or for the national scale model that you want to run and just input this raster data set into the tool itself. It's got a covered study area that you're interested in, but other than that, the, the tool will work with that in the background to create um, metrics of habitat quality that we'll get into later. You also need data on roads, and for a national tool, we decided to use the USGS National Roads data set as part of the National Map um, Infrastructure Geospatial Mapping Suite. Um, and 
this map, this this data set helps provide um, data on traffic volume, speed limit, and the right of way width. So the things that actually matter to monarch ecology and that have been built into the model. Again, it's uh, download links have been provided in the methodology documentation as well as the tool itself. So it's really easy to grab this for your state or for the national scale that you want to run it at. Those are the, the basic big data layers that you need to provide it. The rest is fairly just, just to provide the model, basically the constraints of where the model runs and where it puts your outputs. So you need to have some sort of study area that can be a state or a county, and it's used to clip these larger data layers to your area of interest. In the case of this example, we're showing Minnesota, since that's where we're based and where we run a lot of these test runs of the model. And then you also need to point it to a folder that the results will end up being put in um, somewhere on your computer. Uh, it's really just to, to maintain the structure of the model within itself so that it knows where to put things. And those are the four that you need to run the model. You can click OK at this point and it will run. It will give you this suitability index. It will give you a sense of where, which roads are better or worse for monarch habitat interventions. However, often DOTs or other state agencies will have data layers that they could, that they would want to um, add on to this analysis. First off was uh, the idea of there are existing areas of known good monarch habitat, be those um, nature preserves or other restore, like native prairie landscapes, national parks, places where it is known that monarchs flock to and that people want to emphasize in the modeling process, there's an ability to put that layer in, just kind of the outlines of where those areas are in your study area. Um, and that will improve the habitat quality metrics in that area. And we'll get into the math of that later a little bit. Um, it's just a sense of making sure that the monarchs, where we know monarchs go, is actually showing up in the model. Um, and then there's also this results suffix um, text input. It's basically, if you want to run this multiple times, say for different counties in your state, you just write in which county as a suffix and the results will all show up in the same folder if you run it multiple times. So it's a way of differentiating the end results. There's also the ability for DOTs to put in individual layers of um, specific data for the state, be that um, data on the adjusted or the average annual daily traffic loads or the speed limits for different roads. And those, those are optional, but you can put them in. Um, and it replaces for where you have data, um, the, the baseline data from the, the national layers. All you need to give it is this, the spatial layer that has the data that you're looking at, in this case, traffic volume. And then within that spatial layer, you have to specify which field actually contains the data so that the model will run on the right data. You don't want it running on the year that the data was taken and getting all these weird, unrelated results. But that in itself is the model um, structure. It's fairly simple. You can run it on a very small amount of inputs, or you can specialize it to your state or your area of interest, depending on the data that you have available. And it will output you a nice map of which roads in your study area are better or worse for monarch habitat restoration, monarch habitat suitability management. And this is what the results look like in their file formats. You, it's more than just the map of roads. You also get maps of milkweed and maps of nectar and the, the things that we'll walk through later that go into creating this overall metric of roadside suitability. So that's how you use it. Um, we can go over questions at the end, but we're going to walk now through the logic of where we, how we got to this idea of roadside suitability. What, what are the different parts of the landscape and the risks of the roads that combine to create a good or an awesome road for monarchs? Um, so yeah, that question, where, how do you compute this index? We broke it into a couple of different um, frameworks. We have the idea that there is a, there's the potential for habitat along roadsides and that potential draws on the greater landscape surrounding whatever roadside you're looking at. And it also has, um, has to do with the ability for that roadside itself to provide 
habitat. So you've got to have milkweed and nectar nearby, and you also want to connect to being monarchs being a migratory species, you want to connect to other areas of core habitat. You want to maximize those benefits, this habitat connectivity and the habitat quality, but you also have to consider the, the fact that roads pose risk to, to wildlife. Roads pose risks in terms of collisions or chemical effluents that leach off of them that might impact monarchs negatively. And so this, the suitability index is basically a balancing act between these two, maximizing potential habitat while minimizing road risks. And to walk that through graphically, you have this overall index um, that is built from the, the, ba the balance of risks and habitat, road risks and benefits from habitat. These scores are themselves built out of specific scores that are more, more tied to actual ecological indices. So chemical exposure from braking along roadsides or the, the risk of collision with semi-trucks or cars for the risk side of things. And then for the benefits for the habitat side of things, this connectivity measures the idea of what's the surrounding landscape of this road and is it good for monarchs? And then along the roadside itself, do you have enough width of right of way along that roadside to actually effectively manage for monarch habitat? Are you providing lots of habitat or is it really just a couple of meters of buffer right next to the road, which might not actually provide a good amount of potential habitat? So these are, these are some scores that derive from specific attributes of roads or the landscape itself. Um, and this, this becomes a, this model of, of attributes and scores. Attributes are, are the actual landscape or road um, data that you're gathering. So the idea that there is a traffic volume and that, is, that can go from anywhere from 100 cars per day to 20,000 cars a day. Similarly, with speed limits, that varies miles per hour, right-of-way widths. All of these are attributes of roads and the habitat surrounding roads. And those need to be turned into scores that can be combined in a logical way to this one overall index of roadside suitability. The way we deal with that is, is basically going creating an index of, from good to poor in terms of each of these scores from the attributes. So for a chemical exposure risk from braking and other uh, hard metals that come off of roadsides, traffic volume really tracks that really well. And so you want a low amount of traffic volume that would provide a good uh, habitat for monarchs or a good roadside suitability for monarchs. Speed limit, similarly, you, you don't want to be going pretty much a middle speed for monarchs. If you're going fast enough, monarchs actually will move over cars based on the aerodynamics of the speed. And at lower speeds, they're also less likely to get hit as a collision risk. So speed limit plays into account as a kind of a middle ground is good. Um, you want wide right of ways so that the wider the right of way, the better the, re the roadside habitat potential score is. You want high habitat quality around the road. So the better the, the beneficial habitat around the roadside, the better the overall habitat around it, the adjacent habitat quality score is going to be. And you want to be closer to these core habitat areas that the model will predict. And so this habitat patch, you want to be close to it. And so the distance, the further you are away, the worse you get. And so that's kind of the, you get these good metrics and these poor metrics, um, these scores from these attributes. And we'll walk through, and as an example later, a couple of roads and how these attributes of roads turn into these scores that turn into the suitability index. It, it's, a, it's a challenge of combining apples and oranges, really. It's all of these different numbers are, are miles per hour or cars or habitat quality, and you have to find a way to combine them correctly. And so we pulled on the, the simple multi-attribute rating technique, which will also show up in the webinar in a couple of weeks um, on the the on-the-ground measurement of habitat quality. Uh, and the basic logic is that you have these, this raw data, these attributes that you translate into scores through a value function. You weight each of those scores against each other and combine them into an overall weighted average, which is our roadside suitability metric. Um, and there's 
there's research on that that you can pull from that is listed in our methodology documents. But first off, how do you get these attributes? How do you pull the traffic volume maps and maps of habitat quality um, from different data sources? So first off, you have this national data source that you provide the model, this national roads map. Um, and based on the road classifications in that map, highways, major roads, local roads, you can provide estimates of traffic volume, speed limit, and right-of-way width. Also, we know states have actual maps of those metrics available, not all of them, but some of them. And so you can overlay individual state data on top of this national map to basically give an update to the general classification index that the model builds initially. Um, and that's how you provide the attributes for roads. It's a fairly simple data gathering process. Basically, you just provide the layers and that's the numbers. For mapping habitat and habitat potential in these distances to these core areas, you, that's where the ecology comes in. That's where the, the fun ecological modeling that we got to do really builds into the model. And so we base it all on um, some land cover layer, in this case, the cropland data layer, and the, the different land cover types that exist, so agriculture, grassland, urban areas, pavement, etc., that can flow into uh, an eventual habitat quality map. So the logic of this, this model within a model, if you will, is you start with a land use, this cropland data layer for Minnesota based on expert knowledge and data tables and papers that exist out there, you can convert this land use map into maps of milkweed and nectar and pesticides, these things that are ecologically significant for monarchs, and combine them into maps of habitat quality. So you combine milkweed and nectar, basically the food and shelter of your monarch, or breeding ground for monarchs, into a, a map of a beneficial habitat. That beneficial habitat is weighted against the risks posed by pesticides, as well as the, the key habitat um, areas that we had mentioned earlier that you can overlay into an overall map of habitat quality for monarchs. And this is, this is scaled from poor to good again. It's this, uh, this score rather than a, a full on ecological metric. From that map of habitat quality, you can pull the top 5%, the top 10%, this, uh, the best habitat in your study area, in the state or in the county, and those are your core areas of habitat, your core breeding grounds for monarchs, and the places that you want to be near to if you're going to be putting in uh, management on, along roadsides. And from those patches, you can get this distance map, this idea of, okay, how far is road A from habitat patch compared to road B? and start to actually get, start to compare roads. So these are the two data layers from this ecological modeling that are pulled into the, the, the smart rating system um, that we use in the larger model. There is a habit, there's a, there are challenges to building these habitat metrics. Um, most of what we just walked through was an example in Minnesota in the North Core for this, for monarchs. Um, and that's where we're most confident in this cropland data layer as the basis for, for all of these milkweed or nectar metrics or pesticide metrics. The further west we move or the further south we move, we start to get into different ecological zones, different ecoregions, and therefore we have to base our model on slightly different data. In the West, there's a, a beautifully robust model of milkweed habitat potential based on climate and elevation and land cover maps and also ground truth with a couple of different estimates of milkweed across these states. And so instead of using the cropland data layer for all of our inputs, we, we copy in this more robust model of milkweed for the West. For the South Core, um, we're working currently to parameterize a different uh, data layer that addresses more concerns of rangeland habitat and pasture versus native prairie, um, and getting at more of the, the habitats that exist in the South rather than in the North. Um, and there are basically, you can download these different regional models and they will all look the same, they will all act the same, they are just based on slightly different um, data that, that's buried in the model itself. So for the user, you just have to download the correct 
model for your ecoregion and it runs the same as it would for any other ecoregion. So now that you know the general logical structure of this model, we'll walk through the example um, that we pulled from South Minnesota, an area that's heavily agricultural, but with a couple of patches of either remnant or restored grassland that provide a lot of habitat for monarchs. So in these regions, there are key roads that might actually provide benefits to monarchs should we uh, manage them correctly. So this little box in the lower, um, the southwest of the state shows up, and this is your overall roadside suitability score. Um, you see this kind of gradient from blue to red, good to bad, um, and we're gonna dig into why these roads are showing up differently in a pretty small area. So we have site A and site B uh, as our, our, the, the places that we'll be focusing on. Um, and as we go through, uh, just to kind of set up what, how I'll be talking about these things, we have, we are, we're co uh, calling back to this idea of attributes and scores. So attributes can be high, medium, and low. You can have a high speed limit or a low speed limit, but that doesn't necessarily translate directly into monarch ecological functions. And so we also color scheme these to to represent how the, the attribute levels translate into scores. And so poor scores would be red, okay is in yellow, and then green shows us good. So you can have a, a downward facing arrow, but that might be good for a monarch, so that is a green downward facing arrow. arrow. Just to make sure that we avoid as much confusion as possible going through the next couple of slides. So we'll start off with uh, the things that are derived from the road layers that you provide the model. And so this is all based on national layers uh, for Minnesota, just to, just to make it simple for the modeling process. And we'll start with traffic volume. So for site A, we have relatively lower traffic volume than site B. Site B is a major um, interstate highway, and so you expect there to be higher traffic volume on that highway than a more a uh, more local connecting road, as you can see, kind of slanting diagonally across site A. And so for site A, medium traffic means a, a, you know, an okay score for monarchs. But for site B, high traffic means risk of collisions, higher risk of um, chemical exposure, and so it's, it's a worse site for monarchs, hence the red arrow. For speed limit, they're, they're kind of similar. Site A being this uh, more local roads is gonna have kind of a median speed limit anywhere from 45 to 55 miles per hour, which is actually much worse for monarchs than your 65, 70 that you're seeing in site B. And so green up arrow in site B means it's actually a better road for monarchs because of this, this higher speed limit than in site A. For right-of-way width, however, um, site B, again, because it's this bigger highway, it has a wider right-of-way, and that's gonna provide more habitat for monarchs. So it's a good, good amount of a wide right-of-way, this higher level of an attribute, which corresponds to a green, a good score. In A, it's more local, it's, it's less interstate, and so you're gonna have skinnier right-of-ways that are gonna provide you know, marginal habitat for monarchs. Not horrible, but not great. However, these are in two vastly different habitat areas. So you can just look at from this map, um, site A has a lot of grassland in it, a lot of this uh, kind of light green naturalized habitat versus site B is all just corn and soybeans. Corn is yellow, soybeans are green. This is just an agriculturally dominated area. And so that's gonna have a lot of different impacts on monarch, on monarch habitat and monarch ability to live in this area. So we're gonna walk through each of the, the ways that this impacts the, the ecology of monarchs. For milkweed, there's a lot more milkweed on grasslands than there are in agricultural lands, so you're seeing a lot darker blue in site A than in site B. Correspondingly, you're seeing a lot better quality of habitat in site A than site B, at least for milkweed for monarchs. For nectar, it's a similar story. You're getting a lot more nectar and a lot more nectar availability once you factor in how monarchs fly through the landscape um, in site A than site B because of this naturalized habitat. And combining those into the, the map of beneficial habitat that we actually use as a score later on, you see that site A is vastly superior to site B based on, based on the habitat metrics that you're getting. And so, so it looks like whereas site B might have had better road attributes, site A has 
much stronger habitat quality. You also look at pesticides and site B is just fully pesticide rich. It's an agriculture environment and that's what we would expect. Site A has a middle amount of pesticides and so, so it's, it's not great, but it's also not, not just across the board heavily um, enriched by pesticides. And so that is gonna have an impact on where the habitat patches are. And so in site A, you actually see that there are habitat patches that show up in the model. Whereas in site B, there are no habitat patches anywhere near, there's no core habitat anywhere near the roads in site B. And so site A is obviously gonna have a higher connectivity metric than site B. Combining these all together, the, the SMART, the attribute weighting technique, um, you can start to see why B and A are ranked so differently. So there are risks and there are benefits. The risks from site A and site B, they're fairly similar. Site A actually has a higher risk of collision and chemical exposure than site B, um, but not by much because there's a lot of traffic flowing through B relative to A. However, these habitat metrics are really what weight A way better than B. You're seeing a lot more benefits from the beneficial habitat and distance to the core habitat areas in A than you are in B. So pulling this all together into an overall roadside suitability metric, you can see why A has a lot more blue in it, a lot better roadside suitability than B because of the individual aspects of the roads or the habitat on the landscape. And so that all comes together in the ways that you can compare things using this index. So that's the model, that is the structure of it, that's how you use it, and that's the logic that underpins both the ecology uh, in terms of a landscape level and then the risks posed by roads. Um, hopefully this has illuminated things for you in terms of both the way to use the model, how, much, how easy it might be to gather these data, and then the robustness of the ecology that underpins all of the, the relationships within the model. So with that, I think that brings us to our question stage. Um, thank you, everybody. Thanks, Chris and Eric. That was great. Um, I have been monitoring the chat room, but there have not yet emerged a lot of Awesome. Would you like to ask if you could type those in? And uh, I am chatting with someone about the availability of the crop layer. Crop land data layer, I believe, is publicly available for the uh, entire U.S. Yep, Chris, Chris uh, I think, had a slide. Um, there's a website. Um, national, yeah, you can jump to it, Chris. Um, but yeah, all the cropland data layers is, is updated uh, annually and available publicly. Yeah, so the Department of Agriculture provides yearly updates um, at a national level. And then you can also go, they have a, a tool to use online that you can outline specific areas of interest, usually states that you can download if you want a smaller file. So easy to grab and there's no editing necessary. You just can plunk it straight into the model. Um, all right, I see some questions now. For the Western states, is availability of nectar plants accounted for in some way? Yes, we use the cropland data layer actually works just fine in the West for nectar and is based on a national assessment that was done previously on um, for bees. And we've made an assumption at this point that uh, the nectar availability for bees is correlated with for, for uh, monarchs. And Chris, is there objective data that correlates between traffic speed and mortality of monarchs? Chris, do you want to describe the yeah. paper that you mentioned to me earlier? Yeah, uh, so Dennis, um, this is kind of the frontier in terms of the ecology research where uh, roadsides and monarchs intersect. So there aren't enough papers. Obviously, we could always have more research done. Um, but there are a couple of landmark papers, one specifically from, it's, I think it's McKenna et al, 2001. Um, and they look at uh, both traffic volume and speed as relates to not just monarchs, but a bunch of different butterfly, lepidoptera, um, mortality rates along roadsides. 
Um, and there's kind of this, uh, this humped curve where at low speeds and at low traffic volumes, you're getting less uh, mortality risks than at higher speeds. There's also been other studies done with dragonflies that look at the, the aerodynamics and the, the, that at higher speeds you're not actually seeing as many um, uh, collision deaths as you expect, given that you expect fast moving cars to hit insects pretty easily. Um, so yeah, there, there are um, objective data correlating these. However, it's definitely an area that could use more research. And then will this presentation be made available? I think, Allison, you're recording this, right? Yes, I am recording it, and we can make that available. Um, uh, so you can hear us talking about it as well as look at it. Uh, but I think also we can, we can post um, the, just the PowerPoint slides themselves. And then we're, we will be working to publish, uh, write this up for publication um, as we have find the time to do so. Yeah, I can add a little to that. Uh, we will be writing this as a final report uh, this summer, and I would expect that to be in the fall. Um, we have one publication in revision at Frontiers. It describes the rapid assessment component of this project. And then we will have one more uh, publication, peer review publication, possibly, if we have um, the time to write it, uh, that could come forth later this year. All right, are there any data sets which could correlate with positives, negatives of roosting sites during the fall migration? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, Allison, do you want to take that one about roosting? Um, I think that those uh, data could be being gathered in uh, projects like Journey North. And uh, someone could create a GIS of those. I do not believe that's been done uh, to date, but it could be an interesting thing to, to look at. And we certainly see um, these layers in this model as being something that could be added to um, over time. Yeah. Um, we do, we are planning, Chris, do you want to go to the sample side for the, this is for breeding and not roosting, but we are right now, this is a map of the roadside layers and the habitat quality. The pink dots are where um, we're coordinating with work that Allison is and others are doing to sample uh, monarchs at all these sites. So we're comparing what we consider moderately good, good, and um, poor habitat with observed monarch data. Um, the next question, I'm unsure how the US da USDA crop layer shows or gets you to a layer for nectar plants and monarch habitat. Chris, could you go to the, um, the expert judgment table slide and then animate through it? And I'll walk through. Yeah, go to the, one more. Yeah, okay, so the way that the, there's a translation in the, in the model that takes the cropland data layer, this reclass table represents a conversion of the land cover into milkweed density, and that comes from uh, results of a paper led by Wayne Thogmartin that was based on milk, that estimated milkweed densities for each of these land cover types. And we use that uh, to translate um, land cover into milkweed. And then the reclass table for nectar is based on a lot of work that's been done on pollinators in general that translates the relative floral and nectar qualities of each of those cropland data layers into an index between zero and one that uh, indicates the quality for nectar plants. So those, that translation then just basically remaps the cropland data layer into milkweed and nectar. And it also, uh, to add on to that, Eric, it also includes um, the, there's a suitability ranking based on milkweed stem density uh, that Allison and Kyle Kasten and others have put together. So there's a lot more equations than just a reclass table that goes into this. It's just for the, for the ease of looking through the logic, this is, this is the easiest way to show it. Yep. Um, 
And then cell size, the next question, cell size for the cropland layer is 30 meters squared. What is the effect of that on roads with fewer lanes or smaller rights of way? And so, yeah, this is, that's been a challenge. And so the, the way that we've done it is to basically say the roads themselves are a location um, along it. And that's why we've treated the roads as a separate process themselves um, because they are linear features. And so the, the habitat part just basically gives us information as to what's going on, what our estimates are of what's going on around, knowing that we probably don't have precise information of what specifically is going on at the roadside. And so then the roadside estimate is actually just based on our um, first on um, basically the larger the road, probably the larger the right of way. And that's just a very simplifying assumption at this point. And so that's why it's hopefully just, this is sort of the first step into pairing up with kind of once you've got a sense of the landscape, what should be done at that site should be, um, that's where the rapid assessment comes in to what, what we actually see there. And then should mowing risk be factored into the roadside habitat suitability? Yeah, ultimately, yes, but we don't have that information at this scale, at sort of a statewide or national scale. So the, the final decision about where to do monarch habitat or where to target is sort of the combination of what we're gonna provide at sort of this broader landscape scale with what's being seen sort of at the fine scale and what management is already ongoing. So the, the mowing risk, I don't know, Allison, you might want to add something about that question about mowing risk. Yeah, the mowing risk is incorporated in the rapid assessment and the habitat calculator quality score that comes out from that. So that's something that can be applied at a finer scale. And if uh, sites are mode in such a fashion that is uh, good for monarch habitat, they receive a higher score than uh, places that are mowed uh, very frequently, for instance. Okay. How do urban landscapes factor into the model? Allison, I'm going to turn that one to you. Well, if I understand the question, it might be asking um, how urban landscapes are rated in terms of vector and milkweed and and as I recall they um, are favorable for them yeah I think they're in is that right yes so I can answer that a little bit um, urban landscapes so the map on the right is a habitat quality map so that's showing you and you can see right where my mouse is that's the Twin Cities in Minnesota so that's a big urban area and on the outskirts of urban land, so the cropland data layer kind of gives you gradations of ur urban urbanness, so like how dense is this urban area. And on, in the less dense areas, it's actually pretty good for nectar and for milkweed as people keep planting more milkweed plants in urban areas. So they do have decent habitat quality, but that is basically undercut by the roads themselves. There's a lot more um, so road... So the, uh, the, the, the short answer then, sorry to interrupt Chris, is that oh, urban please. landscapes are integrated in the same way that the rest are. There, yes. There's a, a milkweed density estimate for um, different um, the land cover types that are in those. The cropland data layer does have different levels of uh, urban sort of uh, high, medium, and low density uh, housing and, and intensity for urban areas. So that is translated into estimated milkweed. Um, and we do have estimates then for nectar uh, plants as well. Um, was predation risk considered in this model? Um, the short answer is no. Um, but Allison, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, there are not a lot of data to inform how the landscape would influence predation. Um, although I think there was a paper in the last year that addressed this. So again, it's a case of, you know, there could be um, improvements made almost immediately <laughs> um, to, to this, but I hope it spurs um, further work. Um, 
Okay, you mentioned a correlation between chemical exposure and traffic volumes. You can see this in high congestion areas, but what about rural interstate highways? They have high traffic relative to the surrounding, but there isn't a lot of braking and comparatively less emissions due to less fuel consumption. Should we assume high chemical exposure along rural low access highways anyway? Uh, that is a good question and very can detailed. Can answer that question? Yeah, is that Emily? It's Emily. Uh, yeah. Hi, I'm hi. Emily Snellrud at University of Minnesota. We are actively working on this question. Um, the answer so far is probably for some things, especially in northern states, uh, traffic volume seems to scale with salt application and so sodium exposure, um, even so even along high volume rural highways, you'll still have elevated sodium, um, which gets to toxic levels, uh, and at least for some metals, they still scale with traffic, uh, in particular zinc. Uh, some of the other heavy metals, which are more toxic, we're actually seeing less of a traffic signature for, which is good. Um, so I'll leave it there. Great. OK, as, as we move further south, we don't have as much cropland as up north. Could the NLCD be used instead, or is it lacking the nectar layer? No, that we could use the nectar layer uh, could be used. Um, the one that we're thinking of using uh, for the south, um, and I just need to contact the folks in the south uh, to help with this, um, is that's called the land fire data or gap USGS gap analysis that has a lot more information on the different types of grasslands, um, since their pasture and grassland is much more abundant than sort of the agricultural crops. Um, so that, I think that would be preferable to the, to the NLCD. The NLCD is actually part of the cropland data layer. Question. Okay. And if you do have questions, I realize Chris and I did not put our emails up there, but we'll be um, sending out the tool around, um, sending the tool around and uh, having you guys test it. Um, thanks for all the great questions. Yeah, many of you have uh, been, um, have, well, we've asked many of you if you'd like to be included on our email list. And if you indicated yes, then we can send out the instructions and link to um, access this model, um, as well as other announcements related to our project. And um, you can always email me, um, and I will put you in touch with Chris and Eric. And if you have any more questions, um, please do not hesitate to call us or email us later, um, because those all make the project better, all the input and feedback. And I um, thanks Chris and Eric for fabulous presentation. I really appreciate it. Ah, here are their emails now. Yes. And again, we'll we'll post this soon. And uh, yeah, hopefully you find it helpful. Okay. All right. Thanks everyone. Have a Thank good afternoon. You. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you all. And you're welcome.